Intel's problems surrounding their stability issues affecting 13th and 14th gen CPUs appear to be getting worse, or rather, the problem may have been worse than we thought initially. When server managers and distributors are talking about obscenely high failure rates and revenue losses in the six figures, I think it's high time that Intel stops ducking their consumers and shifting the blame on motherboard manufacturers or user error and gets down to the bottom of this problem. Let's discuss that in this video. Hey, if you enjoy content like this, drop a like, make sure to subscribe, and smash that bell so you never miss another video. Hey, what is going on guys? Danny here, welcome back to the channel and I hope you've all been doing well. I wanted to revisit a topic which we discussed on the channel earlier this year pertaining to stability and performance issues surrounding Intel CPUs. As Wendell from Level 1 Tech had recently released a video on his channel and then did a collab discussion with GN on their channel which had some very interesting information shared that we'll discuss later on in this video. This has been an ongoing topic that goes as far back as last year and really ever since the 13th gen CPUs were released on the market in 2022. Many users have reported instability with their 13th and 14th gen CPUs, especially the higher end CPUs like the 13900K and 14900K. These instability issues varied from a variety of instances such as blue screens of death, crashing in games, seeing out of video memory error messages, lagging, stuttering during desktop use, high DPC, and more. I knew that diagnosing this problem wouldn't be an easy task, and till this day we still don't know the exact reason why there's been so many problems plaguing these Intel processors. Is it a microcode bug? Is it software related? Are they being overclocked too hard? Is there a defect in the hardware? Who knows? Many other YouTubers have put out some excellent videos showcasing their problems, some of the fixes they applied, as well as putting out some theories as to what the underlying problem possibly could be. Brian from Techia City was one of the first guys on the platform to talk about the issues last year, and he's had conversations with individuals while he was at Computex in 2023, who are within the engineering circles of the manufacturers, and was told that this was happening because of the input-output hub being detached from the CPU directly. Buildsoid on his channel talked about various settings within motherboards such as power limits and LLC settings that could be causing the problems. And speaking of motherboard settings, manufacturers over these past couple of months have been releasing BIOS updates with new Intel profiles that adhere to the Intel stock power delivery guidelines when it comes to wattage, current, and LLC values. And I felt as though this was probably one of the things that was causing instability for a lot of users. Because prior to this, many motherboard manufacturers would have unlimited power limits set as the default from the factory. So this could result in users essentially running overclocked CPUs. As many users who were experiencing issues said their problems were fixed, when they had lowered the PL1 and PL2 values to the actual stock guidelines, and that fixed it for them. Some users said they were able to avoid crashing in games by just simply lowering their boost ratio multiplier by a hundred or a couple hundred megahertz, as suggested by some game devs. Some folks had to ensure that their current limits were set up properly at 307 amps or 400 amps. If you guys remember that Reddit thread I shared in my previous video talking about this subject, and if you have been having issues with your 13th or 14th gen chip, I highly recommend checking it out. That thread is still quite active and over the course of these last couple of months, there have been numerous users who have contributed to it by adding their experiences and also shared what settings worked for them. And what's good is that this thread consists of users who are running a variety of different motherboards from Asus, MSI, Gigabyte, and even NZXT. So if you're currently experiencing issues yourself, some of this information shared in this thread could be quite valuable to you. One of the other things that I suggested was how many people were using boards with unstable memory or XMP, and as someone who's gone down the DDR5 tuning rabbit hole, one thing I can say with confidence is that memory XMP profiles as well as QVL lists are garbage. With DDR5, I've seen far too many instances of XMP profiles being unstable, or where motherboards were cranking certain voltages way too high. I was messing around with a 7600 mega transfers kit from Patriot, and when just enabling the XMP profile on my test bench with a 13900K, my system aged was being set to like 1.37 volts. Now, I don't know who exactly would be to blame here if that's the memory DIMM manufacturer 
or the way MSI's board was handling it, but do you know what voltage my chip's system agent runs stable at? 1.15 volts, that's it. And even with my 14900K on my ASUS ROG Apex, the team group XMP setting was at like 1.3 volts for the system agent, and all I needed was 1.14 volts for this chip. The same goes for IMC voltage and my VDDQ, they were being set at above 1.4, 1.45 volts, when all I needed was I think 1.28 volts for my IMC. IMC voltage and my VDTQ was at 1.35. There are some specific sweet spots that will only work for the chip and for some reason if you're above or below it, instability can occur. That's just the experience I've had with tinkering with DDR5 and it's less forgiving than DDR4. You guys will see how memory plays a role into our discussion later on. Let's circle back to the level 1 tech video and by the way guys, links to all of those videos and threads will be posted in the video description. Wendell said he's done a lot of work over these past 4 months gathering data from game game developers, reviewing crash dumps and crash reports to see what's been going on. And it really shows with the amount of data and valuable information he shared, it really could not have been achieved without sifting through all that data, and that's something the community should appreciate. He mentions a game dev team that works with Epic, stating how they don't think that the pre-shader issues users encounter are due to a problem with Unreal, but rather a problem with Intel CPUs, and they discuss similar tweaks that we've discussed before as well as what users in that Reddit thread were posting about how you could go about avoiding it and resolving it. Wendell also mentioned how the vast majority of game crashes were seen from 13th and 14th gen CPUs, while very little were seen from 12th gen CPUs and also very little crash reports from AMD. Furthermore, some of the system errors were IO errors, which relates back to what Brian was talking about on his channel. This would also explain why when these crashes were occurring, users were seeing out of video memory error messages and then thinking their GPUs were unstable. Now I'm not saying this to undermine Wendell's work at all or anything, but we've known for quite some time now that PC gamers using i9 CPUs, and I'm also seeing a number of 13th and 14th gen i7 users have been experiencing issues in games, and again, what they have been told to do as a variety of things such as ensure correct power settings, lower their multipliers, etc. So that is why a lot of people were also blaming motherboard manufacturers instead of Intel and thought that hey once all these motherboards have the latest BIOS updates with the stock Intel profile these users won't have any problems. As there were theories that these CPUs were just pushed too hard which is why they were experiencing problems in games. But Wendell actually took his research beyond just your regular average consumer who's a gamer and he's also gathered information from servers in the data center. One of the most important things to keep in mind when it comes to servers is that stability is a huge priority for these environments. They need to aim for 100% stability, and these servers aren't using gaming Z790 motherboards. They use a W680 motherboard which has different power delivery requirements, and they don't run the chips with crazy high power limits or really high memory speeds because like I said, stability is key. So you think that they wouldn't have any problems, right? Well, Wendell explains how some of these servers, whether they were using a W680 board from Asus or Supermicro also experienced crashes. He said a whopping 50% of systems deployed were experiencing the crashes and disabling e-cores or even disabling hyper-threading didn't fix their problems. But there were some systems where disabling e-cores did actually fix the problems. With some systems they said they had to run some very conservative DDR5 speeds at 4200 mega transfers. That's basically DDR4 territory in order to actually stabilize the system. Now getting a bad PC part isn't uncommon. For those of you who have been in the industry for a while now and have built multiple systems, you've probably had to RMA a part here and there. I've had to RMA a small portion of CPUs myself over these years. Having a small minuscule amount of CPUs out of thousands and hundreds of thousands be bad isn't uncommon, but when we're talking about a 50% defect rate, that implies to me that this isn't just a small batch that went wrong, but there is something inherently wrong with these CPUs, whether it's a broken design that Brian was talking about or if it's a quality control issue in their fabs. One of the data center server providers told Wendell that they were dealing with a higher than usual support demand for those Intel systems where they just said screw it, we're going to have to start charging a higher premium for support calls, a thousand dollars higher compared to AMD because this is getting too costly for us. Another game developer also told Wendell that they could be looking at potentially a 100k in damages 
due to lost players because of their server crashes, which had these Intel CPUs running in them. What's also interesting from Wendell's findings is that these problems are occurring on Linux servers as well. And one of the theories that was thrown around when this problem started to initially surface was that, oh, it's a Windows problem and Intel's got to optimize their scheduler properly for Windows. But now we know Linux users have been experiencing these errors as well. I think this problem is a lot bigger than some people are grasping because it's one thing to say that, oh, your gaming motherboard was just running an extreme overclocking profile and that caused the CPU to malfunction. But in this case, we're talking about a server environment where they're generally running conservative settings to prioritize stability, lower power consumption, lower heat, and lower noise. Another interesting takeaway from this is that server distributors were reporting how systems would be fine upon initial setup, they would continue to run fine for a while, and then all of a sudden, problems would start to appear afterwards. This was something I actually covered in my previous video where we looked at Newegg and Amazon reviews of users reporting how their systems were fine when they set them up, they were working fine for a few months, and then later on, they started to experience crashes, blue screens, stutters, and lag. This is how Erox problems also started as well, where he said his system was working great, and then all of a sudden, he started to have all sorts of problems and from the discussions he and I had he went through loads of troubleshooting and just couldn't solve them which eventually led to him switching back to AMD. Since we're on the subject of longevity one of the things I wanted to touch upon was an update in regards to how my system was doing because I said in my last video that I actually haven't been having any problems at all aside from DPC issues because earlier this year I switched to a 14900K with a Z790 Apex and 48 gigabytes of DDR5 that I manually overclocked in two to 8000 megahertz and one of the things that I, I did do from the start was I turned off all of the Asus AI nonsense, disabled multi-core enhancement and then used the stock Intel guidelines and lowered my LLC. This was before there were any official Intel stock profiles and since then I have had no stability issues or crashes. Again the only thing I had was the high DPC latency issues that got solved through Unpark CPU and I'm attributing that to more of a scheduler issue if anything. But Apart from that, I haven't had any issues. The system has performed up to my expectations in a variety of scenarios, from gaming to content creation. So I guess I should feel lucky as I'm probably one of those in the 50% who's not actually affected by this problem. As this problem was reported by people who were using gaming motherboards, the theory was that while well, the high power profiles and overclock profiles or the AI stuff was degrading the CPUs, but now we're talking about CPUs deployed in a server setting using conservative settings and they still started having problems down the road. So how do you explain that? PC Gamer recently posted an article citing Wendell's video and they also sourced a game studio known as Aldron Games and this is what they stated. Intel is selling defective 13th, 14th gen CPUs and the failure rate for affected processors is nearly 100%. Despite all released microcode, BIOS and firmware updates, the problem remains unresolved and over the last 3-4 to four months we have observed that CPUs initially working well deteriorate over time, eventually failing. Shockingly, the game studio also says that the failure rate we have observed from our own testing is nearly 100%, indicating it's only a matter of time before affected CPUs fail. When it comes to this stage where game server managers and server providers are reporting to the media that we're also experiencing failures, they're switching to AMD and that they're going to stop distributing Intel 13th and 14th gen systems altogether. This really isn't a good look for Intel at all. And you know, being an average consumer for a company like Intel and Nvidia, you often think that sure, the marketing is loud, but gamers are a small portion of their revenue compared to the data center so when issues occur with gamers they're going to be a bit complacent and you know the urgency won't be there but now that we're dealing with situations where it's a business to business and not just an individual, hopefully this sparks some sort of urgency with them because these are clients that need 100% stability or their operations cannot work. Along with that, these clients are ordering parts in masses in large volumes, so when they say they're going to be switching to a competitor, that's going to hurt. But even for regular consumers, I don't want to undermine them as this shouldn't be happening, period. Now, I'm not saying that the user can't be expected to do any configuring on their own. Obviously, basic stuff like setting your XMP in the BIOS, things like that are a given. But when you have extensive guidance, guidelines that you're telling the user to check, such as power limits, developers are having to make tutorials on how to go to the BIOS and change the multiplier, then you have a problem that needs to be addressed. You shouldn't have to do any of that in order to make your system work. If you're someone who works a full-time job, you come home and have to take care of household errands, perhaps you have a family and have kids that you need to tend to, then you finally get an hour or two of playtime, but then, oh wait, your system is crashing, and now you've just wasted whatever time you had left for your leisure because you got a troubleshoot. That is 
a very infuriating experience. What's upsetting about all this is that these problems have been reported for almost two years now, and they really started to gain a lot of traction earlier this year, and despite all of that, Intel still remains quiet about the whole ordeal. I get it that they're still probably working on deducing what the root cause is, and they don't want to make any statements that are wrong or mislead people. More importantly for them, they just probably don't want to cause a panic with their shareholders. However, at the very least, they can come out and say that in the meantime, we're here to help out for those who need it. They have been working with motherboard manufacturers, and I've been seeing free frequent updates from vendors so that's good, though I have seen comments from users who stated that despite applying those profiles and settings, their problems are still there. And the next course of action was to RMA. Now when it comes to RMAs, I've been hearing some mixed reviews about that as well. Some folks said that they sent in their chips and got replacements uh, pretty easily, whereas some have reported their claims have been denied by Intel. Hardware Times reported on this recently, and they are made two chips. One was a 14700K and the other was a 13900KF. They said that the 14700K was accepted for the RMA, while the 13900KF was denied because apparently the company providing one RMA was already going above and beyond. That is some garbage BS right there. It doesn't matter how many products you RMA for the client. If they're both deemed defective, they should be replaced. There's no other discussion to be had beyond that. I found this Reddit thread of a user who reported having a gradually deteriorating experience and eventually had to RMA their CPU, but were told it would take about 3-6 to six months for a replacement, or they could accept a refund which would be processed sooner, but even that was quite a hassle for them to get, and there are others in the comments section talking about how inconsistent their experiences have been, where one RMA was smooth and then their second RMA was a nightmare. This shouldn't be happening, especially when there's so much evidence out there pointing towards these processors having some inherent issues. I'm not sure if it's a communication problem within the company or a lack of training for their RMA centers which sometimes operate through a third party, but right now it's of the utmost importance that Intel treats their customers right, because this is just going to have a bad knock-on effect and I'm already seeing it in the comment sections where folks who have stated they've been primarily using Intel for many years are now looking to switch to AMD. So I guess AMD should be thankful for Intel for the free marketing and sales campaign. In any case, the more the situation drags on without any further official statement, it's just going to become worse for them. For those who are affected by the problems, I'm honestly hoping you guys can get them resolved. I know how much it sucks to have a machine that just does not work right to your expectations, especially after spending so much money on it for your work or for your gaming activities. But in any case, that's going to do it for this one, you guys. I'm hoping this is resolved soon, but I've got a feeling we'll be revisiting this topic again in the near future. If you guys found this video to be informative and entertaining, then leave a like. Let me know your thoughts and comments down below. Be sure to check out the video description for cool links and ways to support the channel, such as using my Amazon affiliate link. And if you're interested in seeing more content like this, then consider subscribing, I'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for watching, take care and I'll see you in the next one.